Dialectic of Defeat, Contours of Western Marxism by Russell Jacoby. Chapter 4, From Politics to Philosophy, The Inception of Western Marxism 2. From 1918 to the present day, every chapter of European history could be headed the defeat of the revolution. So Panikok paraphrased Marx in 1927. By June 1924, when Lucas and Korch were denounced as left communists by the keepers of the Soviet orthodoxy, the major post-World War I upheavals were passed, but hardly forgotten. By their participation in these events, Lucas and Korch each provided clues to the political significance of their philosophical writings. This explains the hostility that greeted history in class consciousness and Marxism and philosophy, both published in 1923. Each book distilled past political experiences. Although neither book openly broached heretical political positions, neither could be insulated from a dense political atmosphere and past. A philosophical denunciation of Lucas by the Russian philosopher Abram de Boren and his followers complemented the political denunciation. This philosophical confrontation etched the divergence between two Hegelian traditions. Lucas leaned heavily on Hegel. Deborin also drew on Hegel and his school was identified and eventually dismissed as Hegelian. The Deborinites used the scientific Hegel to slay the historical Hegel of Lucas. Hegel collided with Hegel. In an afternote to the first edition of his book, Korch expressed his theoretical solidarity with Lucas, yet their theoretical closeness was partly an illusion. Their positions intersected, but each moved perpendicular to the other. Lucas shifted from a Hegelianized Marxism and left con communism toward philosophical orthodoxy and political compromise. Korch passed from conventional philosophical and Marxist past to philosophical and political heresy. For, for an instant, their paths crossed. Neither Lucas's nor Korch's philosophical works are discussed here in any detail. This has been done well elsewhere. This chapter, rather, seeks to illuminate the fog that shrouds the boundaries between philosophy and politics in Western Marxism. The relation between the early pre-Marxist and the leader Lucas continues to burn its way through books and studies. Here it must suffice to recall Lucas's roots in philosophical idealism and literary criticism. Lucas himself situated his theory of the novel, 1916, within the Hegelian revival and judged it Hegelian in spirit and letter. The continuities between the Lucas of this period and Lucas the communist are hardly in doubt and they are captured by the comment expressing an initial reluctance to accept Lucas into the Communist Party. A crazed Hegelian is still far from being a communist. A 1907 essay, later included in Soul and Form, argued that novelists and Schlegel did not represent art for art's sake, but pan-poeticism or the ancient dream of a golden age. But their golden age is not a refuge in a past that has been lost forever, which occasionally haunts beautiful fairy tales. It is the goal whose attainment is the duty of life of every man. Eleven years later, Lucas, no longer every man, but deputy commissar of public education in the Hungarian Soviet, Soviet Republic, declared that beautiful and instructive fairy tales be taught to the young. Shortly before joining the Communist Party in 1918, Lucas enunciated the issues that were to dominate his thinking in the coming years the relationship between political transformation and human emancipation. They were not identical. In Bolshevism as Moral Problem, 1918, Lucas affirmed that the objective relations did not guarantee freedom. The class struggle might conclude with a victory of the proletariat. If pure sociology registered a social change, however, this change did not yet spell freedom. Freedom presupposed, but could not be confused with, a transformation of class relations. To ensure freedom, a subjective element must supplement the objective relations, the will to realize freedom. Without this will, the proletariat as liberator was unthinkable. Subsequently, Lucas translated this ethical postulate into an organizational imperative. 
to incorporate emancipation into the very fiber of objective transformation. The revolutionary apparatus of political transformation remained locked within dead objective relations and did not automatically yield liberation. In his sharpest and baldest formulation, <coughs> Lucas, as a government official, proclaimed, politics is merely the means, culture is the goal. If the term culture is loaded with ambig ambiguity, the essential meaning is not. Culture encompassed human freedom. Political struggle and economic re reorganization did not in themselves constitute the ends for human existence. Marxists participated in political conflict, not for its own sake, but to organize a society where politics receded before human emancipation. Lucas's The Old Culture and the New Culture, 1919, provocatively elaborated these ideas. Lucas defined capitalism by its reductionism, an insatiable market subordinating all to profit and money. Communists did not work to establish a better or more efficient economy, but to dis dis disestablish its stellar structure. Freedom subverted the dictatorship of economic relations. Lucas's formulations recalled those of Marx. Emancipation was not freedom of, but freedom from property. Liberation from capitalism, declared Lucas, means liberation from the rule of the economy. When the dominion of the economy is subverted, culture is revolutionized. It is no longer an instrument for something else, but an end in itself. The possibility for a new culture that would release the creative essence of humanity from the authority of the cash nexus was opened. The following passage pulsates with the utopian note of Lucas's analysis. The reason an economic reorganization is absolutely necessary is that because of the unique structure of human consciousness, immediate evils and miseries, even though they are on a much lower level than the ultimate questions of human existence, nevertheless, with few exceptions, block the ultimate questions from consciousness. These immediate evils and miseries are not by themselves capable of bringing to consciousness the final questions of existence. We can clarify this with a very simple example. Someone is racking his brain over a complex scientific problem. During his work, he contracts an unrelenting toothache. Clearly, in most cases, he would be unable to remain in the stream of his thought and work until the immediate pain is relieved. The annihilation of capitalism, the new socialist reconstruction of the economy, means the healing of all toothaches for the whole of humanity. However utopian, idealist, or outrageous, this was authentic Marxism for Lucas. It did not rest on an arbitrary reading of Marx. In an essay from the same year, The Changing Function of Historical Materialism, 1919, later included in History and Class Consciousness, Lucas selected as Marx's basic proposition that consciousness does not determine existence, but social existence determines consciousness. Yet the very nature of the revolutionary transformation reverses this proposition. The economic structure is stood on its head. Social consciousness no longer obeys, but issues the commands. This defines the uniqueness of revolution, a leap that abolishes the grip of reification. As Lucas recognized in these analyses the category of consciousness, first noted and elucidated in classical German philosophy, assumed a supreme role. Hegel and Marx intersected. Lucas unearthed the historical Hegel for Marxism. He criticized a scientific and positivist Marxism oblivious to the critical import of consciousness. Marx assumed the greatest legacy of Hegelian philosophy, the idea of mind developing from complete lack of consciousness to a clear, ever-growing self-consciousness. Alluding to vulgar Marxists, Lucas added that only the superficiality and philosophical philistinism of his successors have obscured this crucial concept. Unable to comprehend Hegel's conception of history, they have turned historical development into a wholly automatic process not only independent of, but even qualitatively different from consciousness. To be sure, Marx modified Hegel. He did not simply substitute materialism for Hegel's idealism. However, as vulgar Marxists often taught, rather Marx enriched and deepened Hegel by locating the development of consciousness in the living processes of society. 
Lucas appended a crucial qualification emblematic of Western Marxism. Marx was altogether too sober and profound a thinker to apply this method to the investigation of nature. The collapse of the Hungarian Soviet Republic after 133 days, August 1919, turned Lucas from an official of a revolutionary government into an exile in a faction, factionalized communist party. For the next several years, his political contributions fell into two categories, addressing the specific issues of the Hungarian party and the wider ones of European communism. As Lucas noted later, a cleavage marked, marked his contributions. In the Hungarian party, Lucas generally backed a moderate, anti-bureaucratic, anti-sectarian, united front. Within the international arena, especially in Germany, Lucas associated with the left communists and supported the theory of the offensive. Although this divergence was real, Lucas's later presentation Facili hung his international leftism on the book of revolutionary messianism. The divergence, the divergence was grounded in the anti-bureaucratic sensibility imbued in Western Marxism. However, insofar as this sensibility was not blind, it implied different tactics for Germany and Hungary. In Germany, parliamentarism risked rebuilding the bureaucratic structures and evils of the social democratic past. In the authoritarian dictatorship of Hungary, anti-parliamentarism lacked meaning. It could only be adopted as a slogan or bravado. On the tactical plane, an anti-bureaucratic impulse bound together the Western Marxists. Lucas, Gramsci, and Luxembourg are linked not by their appraisal of parliamentary strategies or by the theory of the offensive. Rather, they converged in their repudiation of a bureau, bureau bureaucratization that threatened the independence or autonomy of the proletariat. On this issue, the echo of syndicalism and Irvin Sabo can be discerned. Lucas wrote that Sabo had brought him into contact with syndicalism and Sorel. To the unsympathetic, Lucas always remained Sabo's disciple. Sabo, like Lucien Hare, for years a librarian, exercised an important impact on students intellectuals, and a left opposition to the Hungarian social democracy. The socialist student club he founded in 1902 included Lucas. In 1905, he published the first Hungarian edition of Marx and Engels. The French syndicalist uh, Lagardel wrote to him in the same year, I agree entirely with you on the interpretation of Marxism. The left opposition that Sabo spearheaded in the Hungarian Socialist Party presented a program in 1905 that attacked the reformism of electoral politics and dictatorial party leadership while defending inner party democracy, all syndicalist principles. Contemporary with Sorel, Luxembourg, and Panikok, Sebo advanced a critique of the bureaucratization of the German Social Democrats. Ethical and subjective idealism inspired his critique. According to Sabo, Marxism suffered from universal vulgarization. The iron laws of economic relations subordinated the subjective element. The SPD was the prime sinner. His 1905 oppositional program stated that we do not want embedded in our Hungarian party the praxis of the SPD, which has elevated strict discipline to a supremely dominating organizational and functional principle. Nor did Engels escape Sabo's censure. As spiritual father of the SPD, he was an arch opportunist. Perhaps Lucas's critique of Engels originated in that of Sabo. As an exile, Lucas frequently contributed to communismus, which regularly published left communists. As noted previously, like the Amsterdam Bureau and its journal, the Comintern Bureau in Vienna and Commun communismus were charged with leftism and finally dissolved. In discussing the journal, Lenin singled out Lucas's The Question of Parliamentarianism, 1920, as especially guilty of leftism. The analysis that Lucas offered in this essay followed closely the earlier party in class, 1919. Both the party and the parliament were judged bourgeois inventions and instruments. When the proletariat fit its actions into the organizational framework of the party, it surrendered to the forms of capitalist society. The party revealed that the proletariat was too strong to abstain from political action 
and too weak to impose its will on society. The party was the external organizational expression of this inner crisis. Lucas dissected parliamentary tactics with the same conceptual knife. Parliament, the bourgeoisie's very own instrument, blocked the proletariat from refashioning the decisive extra-parliamentary political reality. To the proletariat, electoral politics diverted and distracted. At best, parliaments were only defensive weapons or preparations for real struggles. The inner logic of the analysis moved away from the bureaucratic party and parliamentary structures toward workers' councils as the authentic arena of proletarian activity. Yet the logic ran up against Lucas's own resistance. As formulated in the final essay of History and Class Consciousness, Lucas fused contraries, workers' councils, and the Leninist party. Loyal to his earliest analyses, he situated the workers' councils beyond bourgeois society, where they incorporated subjectivity and self-activity. Nevertheless, the political efficiency and theoretical justification for the Leninist party increasingly impressed Lucas. The party not only represented consciousness, it was, con it was consciousness. In the essays between 1920 and 1923, Lucas emphasized either the workers' council or the party, until finally, in history and class consciousness, he simply welded the two together. Although theoretically ex executed with sureness, the weld lacked strength. To document Lucas's position on all the events of the communist movement would be pointless. Generally, the council motif eroded and the party gained the upper hand. Yet Lucas found little difficulty in commenting both centralized discipline and in commending both centralized discipline and Luxembourgian spontaneity. For instance, in the same year of his leftist question of parliamentari parliamentarianism, he published a self-criticism of his essay Party in Class. He criticized himself and the Hungarian Communist Party for misunderstanding the indispensability of the party in leading the revolution. Lucas noted that other parties of the revolutionary movement shared this failure and alluded to both the KAPD and the Amsterdam Bureau. He defined the error as the belief that the party organization in essence was a child of bourgeois society, which in the proletarian class struggle could be replaced by a special proletarian organization workers' councils, factory councils, industrial unions, etc. He never jettisoned his original critique of the bureaucratic party as alien to the working class, however. Here he came closest to the Dutch Marxists. Lucas rejected the proletarian organization as simply an instrument to gain state power. Rather, the revolutionary organization should incorporate freedom and autonomy. To Lucas, as to Panikok, this distinguished the proletarian organization from any other. Lucas's experience in the exiled Hungarian party ensured that the anti-bureaucratic note did not dissipate in his writings. The Hungarian situation cannot be completely abstracted from the wider context, especially since Bela Kuhn, leader of the faction opposing Lucas, played a key role as a Comintern agent in the March action. Perhaps because of his Moscow residency, Lucas was in Vienna, Kuhn obtained the goodwill of the Russian leaders. He attacked the Vienna group for its Hegelian rubbish and raised the specter of its syndicalism and Dutch Marxism. He also proposed an aggressive policy for the Hungarian party. While the Vienna group cautiously cultivated reliable contacts with sympath sympathizers in repressive Hungary, Kuhn advised the party leadership to return to Hungary regardless of the risk, to create a mass movement. Because the probability of arrest was high, this plan appeared to the Vienna group to be political as well as personal suicide. Lucas's Politics of Illusion, yet again, 1922, caustically attacked the politics that Kuhn championed. His polemic revealed the core of Lucas's organizational thinking, within the territory he knew best, Hungary. In an analysis that smacked of Levi's indictment of the March action, Lucas charged that Kuhn had constructed a plan to please Moscow that ignored Hungarian realities. He designed his, he designed his proclamations of an imminent revolutionary outbreak to secure his position in the international revolutionary movement. 
To Kuhn and his faction, the danger facing comrades in Hungary counted for little. But they were certainly thinking seriously about those comrades who now enjoy the status of international celebrities and whose position would doubtless be strengthened if they could claim to represent not a small illegal party, but a powerful mass party. The solace of its bureaucracy characterized Kuhn's organization. As it feigned revolutionary progress, corrosion set in. Sham results were required in order to impress Moscow and advance careers. The entire organization ineluctably turned corrupt. Comrades engaged in illegal work issued false reports that provided the expected good news. The Central Committee degenerated into an empty bureaucracy. Since no real work was accomplished, the party rested on pure authority and blind and slavish submission. Lucas saw the future. Such artificial and illegitimate illegitimate cultivation of authority serves only to make the party bureaucracy even more hollow and soulless. It turns it into an office with bosses and subalterns. The threat and reality of bureaucratic corruption did not induce Lucas to renounce the party. Rather, he emphasized all the more its non-bureaucratic human relations. In an essay from 1921, Organization and Revolutionary Initiative, Lucas did not shy away from prescribing centralization and discipline. Yet Lucas's qualification touched the marrow of the revolutionary organization. The centralization of a revolutionary party cannot possibly be achieved by bureaucratic and technical means. The fully developed consciousness of the party members is a prerequisite. In words that could be taken from Panacoke and Gorder, Lucas affirmed, thus the question of organization reveals itself to be an intellectual question. Organization is not a technical question, but the supreme intellectual question of the revolution. The double logic drove Lucas in a direction that few followed. On the one hand, he militantly defended the centralization and discipline of the Leninist party. On the other, he doggedly affirmed the non-bureaucratic and emancipatory nature of party life. A left communist impulse infused the Leninist party of Lucas. Party life was assembled out of patches of freedom, camaraderie, solidarity, trust, and so on. This was not a secondary consideration. These qualities set the proletarian party apart from other organizations. Without these bonds of freedom, the party of revolution lost its raison d'etre. History and class consciousness, especially towards a methodology of the problem of organization, renounced, renounced neither authoritarian centralization nor non-authoritarian freedom. In that final chapter, the arguments of the book coalesced. Lucas's wider analysis of capitalism bestowed a critical importance on the revolutionary organization that was less technical than intellectual. Capitalism is not automatically metamorphosed into socialism, as vulgar Marxists often believed. Capitalism leads to crises and wars, but no further. Between capitalism and socialism resides an empty space beyond determinism. At this juncture, only the possibility exists that the hitherto object of the economic process, the proletariat, will become the subject. Since this con conversion from object to subject is not automatic, it is a free action. It depends solely on the proletariat attaining self-understanding in class consciousness. Lucas alluded to Gorder. This task is especially difficult in Western Europe because the proletariat can call upon no ex extra proletariat allies. Everything pivots on the insight of the proletariat. Within this framework, Lucas situated the revolutionary organization, the conscious leap into freedom. The leap bore the traces of its capitalist past, but also participated in future freedom. This was the intractable problem. The party as a vessel of freedom collided with the society of unfreedom. It straddled two worlds. The organization consists necessarily of men who have been brought up in and ruined by capitalist society. The task was to mitigate the, the catastrophic effects of this situation while eschewing utopian hopes of a total transformation of its human material. The inner life of the party is one unceasing struggle against this, its capitalist inheritance. Untouched by any depth, 
psychology. Lucas reiterated that the incorporation of the whole personality is a decisive weapon. Party members enter with their whole personality into a living relationship with the whole of the life of the party. Active participation precluded that the party degenerated into mechanical obedience. For Lucas, the party transcended a political tool. Freedom, as the classical German philosophers realized, is something practical. It is an activity. And only by becoming a world of activity for every one of its members can the Communist Party hope to overcome the passive role assumed by bourgeois man. History and class consciousness presented a defense of the Leninist Party so extreme that it committed an offense. Inasmuch as no real party could measure up to its justification, the party stood condemned by its defense. This was the heresy of Lucas's orthodoxy. He adopted Leninism without surrendering Western Marxism. Although he devoted much of his later career to erasing its traces, the Hegel of consciousness and subjectivity indelibly marked, marked his Marxism. Compared to that of Lucas, Korch's impact was limited, yet its modesty owed more to his political tra trajectory than to his theoretical oeuvre. If Lucas and Korch politically and theoretically intersected in 1923, henceforth their paths rapidly diverged. By 1926, the Communist Party had expelled Korch. Lucas never ceased to practice uh, self-criticism, half feigned, half real, to shore up his position in the Communist Party, but Korch began a long and isolated reevaluation of Marxism. By the time of his death in 1961, he had been forgotten. Yet this is a political fact, not a judgment on the quality of his work. His Karl Marx, 1938, is outstanding and remains ignored. His theoretical labors continually stimulated, stimulated and sustained those outside of Marxist orthodoxy. In the United States, he worked peripherally, peripherally with the Frankfurt School. The possibility of a major collaborative project, although broached, was not realized. Bertolt Brecht considered Korch his teacher and continuously sought his advice. Korch partly inspired what may be the best American book on Marxism from these years. Sidney Hook attended Korch's lectures in 1928 to 1929, and his Towards the Understanding of Karl Marx, 1933, thanked Korch and testified to his thought. Yet Korch's isolation was palpable, as even T.W. Adorno noted after meeting him in the late 1930s. Like history and class consciousness, although smaller in size and conception, Korch's Marxism and philosophy was a philosophical work that was received as political heresy. The book echoed the general philosophical themes of Western Marxism. Marxism was not simply a political economy, but a critique, and a critique included a philosophical confrontation with the intellectual, ideological structure of society. Vulgar Marxists deemed philosophy obsolete, surpassed by political economy. This was a fundamental misinterpretation. Marxism must be as multidimensional as is the social reality, and this required alertness to the ideological glue that bound society together. Korch called for intellectual action and drew a parallel with Marx's statements on the relationship of political to economic action. Just as political action is not rendered unnecessary by the economic action of a revolutionary class, so intellectual action is not rendered unnecessary by either political or economic action. As with history and class consciousness, the passions that Marxism and philosophy stirred implied that beyond the pure philosophical horizon smoldered a political fire. Its size or extent was barely visible, since Korch surrendered fewer clues than did Lucas. This partly reflected a contracting political universe. Lucas's undi undisguised left communism thrived in 1919 to 1921. In those years, left communism was reality, openly discussed and denounced. By 1923 to 1924, when Korch emerged an oppositional Marxist, less was tolerated. Moreover, the respective positions within the communist movement differed radically. 
Lucas belonged to a minority faction in a small exiled communist party. Korch was a communist party representative in the Reichstag for the most important party outside of the Russian and ed edited the German Communist Party's KPD major theoretical journal. Like all activity in the KPD, his conduct and writings were closely monitored. Korch's early development and writings offer less interest in drama than those of Lucas. What has been said of Lucas's transformation from aesthete to communist party member, his conversion took place in the interval between two Sundays, cannot be said of Korch. Not a sudden leap, but a gradual development led the independent student socialist before World War I into the Communist Party. Korch joined the SPD in 1912 and the opposition, Independent Social Democrats, USPD, to the SPD in 1919. He followed the majority of the USPD into the KPD in 1920. For his political and theoretical contributions, the most important experience seems to have been his years in England between 1911 and 1914, when he admired and adhered to the Fabian Society. For Korch, the Fabian Society provided an Arch Archimedean point from which to criticize standard German Marxism. Unlike the Germans, the Fabians did not believe that socialism would arrive without a practical activism and an ethical idealism, a Geistertat. Moreover, the Fabians did not establish a political party, but a spiritual center. Korch's phrase, practical socialism, summarized the lessons he drew from the Fabians. The term did not do justice to its content, however. Korch placed practical socialism squarely in opposition to orthodox and scientific Marxism. Orthodox Marxism posited that not only the economic preconditions, but the socialist society itself would ripen on the capitalist tree, one day falling to the ground. Practical socialism, conversely, is no scientific socialism. It is more than science. It is the creative will and preparation to action. The German October 1923 set the scene for Korch's political role in heresies. After the 1921 March action, this was the next and last offensive of the KPD. The economic and political situation seemed propitious as the furious inflation of 1923 devastated much of the middle and working classes. The Russians, in particular Trotsky, nourished hopes of an imminent German revolution. The leaders of the KPD, Heinrich Brennler and August Talamer, although less convinced, let the Russians outwit, overrule, or convince them. If the planning and Russian participation were more extensive than in the March action, the result was the same. Utter failure because of bungling and lack of mass support. The German October survived as a major issue in the subsequent factional battles of the KPD and the Common Turn. It merits several lines in the histories of threats to the German state. The German October led to a change of leadership of the KPD. <clears throat> Brandler and Telemer, stained with a disaster, became a liability to Grigory Zinoviev, leader of the Common Turn. In addition, in their post-mortem, Brandler and Telemer charged that the Common Turn failed to accurately gauge the objective conditions. This was unacceptable to Zinoviev. Linking Brandler to Trotsky, who had just openly criticized the Soviet leadership, Zinoviev command commanded, We must have a change in leadership of the KPD. He threw his support to a new and left leadership of Ruth Fisher and Arkady Maslow. Zinoviev, Fisher, and Maslow agreed on at least one point, but a crucial one at the time. The common turn did not misappraise the objective conditions, but Brandler and Telemer misled and misorganized the revolution. This constellation of forces defined the field in which Korch assumed a political role, an unstable alliance between the new left leadership of Fisher and Maslow and the common turn directed by Zinoviev. The alliance was unstable because the left leadership of the KPT tended toward left communism, challenging orthodox Leninism. 
For instance, Maslow had already been identified as a left communist, and his transgressions were serious enough to gain Lenin's reproach. A special committee had even been invoked to examine his record. Yet clarity is cheap after the events. Initially, many left communists believed or hoped that they fought on the same side as the common turn against reformism and social democracy. Like Lucas, they tried to reconcile local autonomy and independence with iron discipline and centralization. By the end of 1923, most left communists, chastised by the events, had discarded these illusions and hopes. For Fisher and Maslow, however, these illusions remained alive for the next two years. The fragility, if not impossibility, of this common turn left, common turn left, pact was not completely obscure, however. Zinoviev, in fact, perceived more accurately than the left the risks of the alliance. From the very beginning, he warned of leftism and ultra-leftism. This warning assumed a regular form. Zinoviev distinguished in the left between the responsible proletarian elements and irresponsible intellectuals. On these grounds, Korch was targeted as an intellectual guilty of ultra-leftism. The Ninth Party Congress of the KPD, April 1924, sealed the victory of the left in the wake of the German October. Zinoviev's letter to the Congress, March 26, 1924, already distinguished the responsible from the irresponsible leftists. The former were profoundly revolutionary workers who emerged from the masses. The other current is represented by a group of leaders from the intelligentsia and is characterized by anti-revolutionary phraseology. In addition to the letter to the Ninth Congress, Zinoviev fired off a series of messages on the dangers of the left intellectuals. At the end of March 1924, Zinoviev and Nikolai Bukharin wrote to several party members warning of tendencies in the party irreconcilable with Bolshevism. These included tendencies to exit from the trade unions, renounce the United Front, and retreat to the perspective of Rosa Luxemburg in the organizational question. All left positions. More damaging, some groups in the party had spoken of a crisis in the common turn. Do not let yourself be lulled by sweet phrases that the ultra-left tendency is very weak. In very similar terms, Zinoviev wrote to Fischer and Maslow. Do not imagine that the ultra-left does not represent a serious force. The banner of Rosa Luxemburg is raised, the United Front attacked, and there is talk of a so-called crisis in the common turn. A correspondent of Maslow reported that Zinoviev was troubled by the left academics. It was in this atmosphere charged by accusations of ultra-leftism and suspicion of intellectuals that two works by Marxist, Marxist philosophers appeared. Lucas's History and Class Consciousness, and Korch's Marxism and Philosophy. Lucas, although fast covering his tracks, was easily identified as part of an ultra-left. Korch, in an afterwards instead of a forewards, appended to an earlier edition of Marxism and Philosophy, expressed his solidarity with Lucas. He noted that while he was completing his book, Lucas's book was published and that Lucas's book, which is based on a broader philosophical foundation, touches at many points on the questions raised here. As I presently see the matter, I am pleased to state my foundational or fundamental agreement with him. On the eve of the Fifth World Congress of the Communist International, June 1924, an issue of International, edited by Korch, appeared containing Lenin and the Common Turn back to back with an article by Boris on the program of the Common Turn. Both caused stirs as ultra left provocations. In the same issue, Korch reviewed several books, including Lucas's History in Class Consciousness and Bukharin's His Historical Materialism. Here, Korch stepped on some Marxist toes. He criticized Bela Kuhn. Lucas's opponent in the Hungarian party for crassly attacking Lucas's book, and he suggested that Bukharin advocated a specifically bourgeois method of science. 
Boris, who was already tainted by ultra-leftism, transgressed not only because he also attacked Bukharin, but because he completely defended Luxembourg, and he did not exempt Lenin from criticism. For these critical essays and reviews to appear in the premier theoretical journal of the KPD on the eve of the Fifth World Congress was interpreted as a direct assault on Comintern politics. The Fifth Congress opened in June with a leading address by Zinoviev. His earlier letters presaged his pronouncement on the KPD. He attacked the ultra-left, specifically naming Lucas and Korch as intellectuals and professors. This theoretical revisionism cannot be allowed to pass with impunity. He relegated to Bukharin the full response to Boris. Fisher sought to parry the blow by dissociating or disassociating Korch from Boris. When Korch and Boris are named in the same breath, when Comrade Korch is thrown into the same pot as Boris, this the German party will not allow. To be sure, Korch's infractions do not seem especially grave, yet in the atmosphere, atmosphere of Marxist law and order, they suffice to identify him as a renegade. He trespassed on both political and philosophical property. As editor of the Internationale, he criticized the common turn and opened its pages to other critics. His Marxism and philosophy, although tactically uncontroversial, smacked of the historical Hegel. Moreover, for those slow to make the connections, Korch openly stated his solidarity with Lucas, who had already been branded a left communist. During the next months, the left leadership of Fischer and Maslow succumbed to or embraced the Comintern position. They became eager Bolshevizers, sniffing out Luxembourgism and ultra-leftism. Maslow himself replied to Boris's article and the Central Committee of the party formally condemned it. The rest of the story can be told briefly. Korch moved increasingly toward the left opposition and Fisher and Maslow increasingly towed the common turn line. They hunted for left deviations or what Fisher called the West European theoretical school, meaning Korch and Lucas. We will not tolerate theoretical deviations, nor make any concessions to the West European theoretical school, even when it acts as Leninist. In this period, Korch was several times identified as part of the radical opposition. These maneuvers culminated in the 10th Party Congress of the KPD, July 1925. Although this nominally reaffirmed the victory that Fischer and Maslow had obtained at the previous Congress, it signaled their downfall. Again, Zinoviev sent a letter to the Congress claiming progress against an ultra-left, although a fever still existed. He named Korch as part of this left, yet Zinoviev's alliance with Fischer and Maslow no longer served a purpose. Only weeks after the 10th Party Congress, Zinoviev turned decisively against them. This shift only appears to be one more obscure change of direction in the common turn, if the nature of the alliance from the beginning is missed. It was always unstable, and this was clearer to Zinoviev than to Fischer and Maslow. Despite their conversion to enthusiastic Bolshevizers, they remained tainted as intellectuals with links to the left opposition. They were convenient allies only after the debacle of the German October. The German party was discussed by the executive committee of the common turn in the middle of August 1925, only weeks after the 10th party Congress. What Zinoviev stated then rings partly true. He originally supported Fischer and Maslow reluctantly as the best opponents to Brandler. Moreover, he had always distinguished between the good proletarian elements and the intellectuals in the left. These discussions, which included members of the German party, announced the changing of the guard. Word did not reach the party at large until Zinoviev's open letter was published in the main party newspaper. Um, Die wrote Fan on September 1st, 1925. The open letter called for the cashiering of Fischer and Maslow, the most direct intervention of the common turn into the KPD to date. The open letter charged that Fischer and Maslow not only failed to resist, but co coquetted with the ultra-left. The brunt of the attack fell on Maslow, since he stood closer to the ultra-left than did Fischer. 
Comrade Maslow sought to oppose a pure left, specifically West European communism, to the opportunism of Leninism. The letter commanded, The entire German party, above all the best comrades, have the duty to break with the relationship that Fischer Maslow Group has established between the party and the common turn. Zinoviev's open letter caused sensation and panic in the party. Few had anticipated that the left leadership of Fischer and Maslow, anointed by Zinoviev, would be so unceremoniously discharged. It did not take long for the party to vote them out. Within days of the open letter, district, meeting, or district meetings of the party were called. Korch no longer minced his words. At the district meeting in Frankfurt on September 9th, Korch denounced the red imperialism of the common turn. Heinz Newman, an early favorite of Stalin, not only attacked Korch for his remarks, but published a long critique of Maslow. In his denunciation, he summarized the heresy. The overriding challenge to Leninism was what he called the West European deviation. The West European devi deviation is the root error, which since Rosa Luxemburg's death runs through our, our whole party history. It is the common characteristic and the unmistakable sign of all deviations from revolutionary Marxism, from Leninism, which have appeared in our ranks. Newman included in this list the KAPD, Levi, and the more recent ultra-leftists. The rest of, the, of Korch's development need not be recounted here. It conformed to a logic and to his past. He next affiliated with a left opposition within the Communist Party and, and formed a group called the Decisive Left. In this capacity, he presented an, anal an anal analysis of the Soviet Union and the Comintern. The Soviet Union ceased to be revolutionary and disrupted the identity between its national interests and the imperatives of the international revolutionary movement. The program he penned ended by demanding that the long-promised internal party democracy be realized. Shortly after this program, he was expelled. Politically, he maintained affiliation with a series of workers' councils organizations, first in Germany and later in the United States. One of his last letters, 1956, affirmed his loyalty to another dream, to theoretically restore the ideas of, Marxist, of Marx that today are seemingly annihilated. A philosophical denunciation of Lucas and Korch seconded the political barrage, yet the fissure within Marxism was evident. Each denunciation proceeded separately and barely alluded to the other. The charge mounted by Zinoviev and Comintern subalterns enunciated political, not philosophical violations. The critique advanced by the orthodox philosoph philosophers stayed clear of explicit politics. Nevertheless, the philosophers did not simply stumble upon Lucas and Korch, a political label hung on them. Ibram Deborin, the dean of Soviet philosophers, stated that Lucas had disciples and led a whole tendency, which included Korch. Jan Sten, another Deborinite, put it more plainly. Philosophically, Lucas represents an idealist, idealistic distortion, a reversion to an old Hegelian idealism. This philosophy reveals in certain of its theses a direct relationship with the left-wing childhood diseases with which political practice is fraught. Yet these were political illusions on the margins of philosophical encounter of the philosophical encounter. To those familiar with the canons of Soviet Marxism or official dialectical materialism, the philosophical critiques of Lucas rehearsed basic tenets. They merit attention, however, because they illustrate dramatically the two Hegelian traditions. Here they directly clashed. Deborin and his school con constituted the philosophical offensive against Lucas. In the Soviet context, they were known and finally condemned as Hegelians, although they harbored no sympathy for Lucas. This is puzzling only if the divergences between the two Hegelian traditions are surrendered. From a Russian and scientific Hegelianism, the Deborinites discerned and rejected in Lucas a historical Hegelianism. 
as in the earlier debates, the evaluation of angles and the dialectic of nature sing sing signaled the breach. In accord with scientific Hegelianism, the Debernites pro proposed the universality of the dialectic, exactly what Lucas challenged. For Lucas and the historical Hegelians, society and history marked the outer borders of dialectics. Within these boundaries, consciousness and subjectivity foreign to pure nature and physical matter were indigenous. For the Debranites, subjectivity and consciousness receded before, before the universal and objective laws of development. Dialectics encompassed not only history, but nature itself. It is to be recalled that Lucas criticized Engels on these grounds. Following Hegel's mistake in lead, Engels had extended dialectics to nature and lost the critical relationship between subject and object. In his critique of Lucas, as well as elsewhere, Deberin reaffirmed the main principles of orthodox Marxism. He designated Marxism a total system, a unified, closed Weltanschauung that governed the whole of reality. The form of the dialectic encompasses the whole of reality, since dialectics set forth the general teaching of the laws of movement and the forms of movement of all being, the natural sciences must also be penetrated by it. Pure nature is not outside dialectics, but is itself dialectical. Dialectics merged into a theory of the objective unfolding of laws. An ally of Debrin, Ladislao Rudis, accused Lucas of subjective idealism. And as much as Lucas restricted dialectics to society, he reduced it to a human creation. And worse, this implied that the dialectics is not an objective law independent from men, but a subjective law of men. On these issues, Deborin insisted that Marx and Engels did not differ. Marx and Engels are in the same way guilty of the ap application of the dialectic to nature. Not Engels, but Lucas himself distorts the teachings of Marx. Engels' Dialectics of Nature, only recently published, 1925, proved to Deborin not only the validity of the dialectic of nature, but its legitima legitimization by Hegel. The Debrinites dominated only briefly as the official philosophers in the Soviet Union. They lost favor and were charged with the same sins of which they had charged Lucas. Hegelianizing Marxism. The irony of these charges hinted at a truth. Hegelian Debronites demonstrated not only the divergence between two Hegelian traditions, but their fate indicated a convergence beyond the divergence. With Engels and the dialectic of nature as the red flags, the two traditions fought. Yet finally, they both shared something. Loyalty to Hegel and the independence of philosophy. This spanned the traditions and to the Soviet guardians of thoughts smacked of sub subversion. Initially, during the 1920s, the Debronites gained ascendancy in the conflict with philosophers known as the Mechanists. The Russian Mechanists represented a rough and ready Marxism, which advocated purging all philosophy from Marxism in favor of the natural sciences. It was advanced most enthusiastically by S. Minin in an article entitled Overboard with Philosophy, 1922. For Minin, philosophy itself was the evil, totally extraneous to Marxism. Philosophy is a prop of the bourgeoisie. Science belonged to the proletariat, but no kind of philosophy did. Away with the dirty linen of philosophy. We need science, only science, simply science. Against crude efforts by the mechanics to liquidate philosophy and reduce Marxism to a natural science, the Debronites rallied to the autonomy and supremacy of philosophy. Precisely on this point, Debrin appealed to Engels and Hegel. The natural sciences did not dispense with, but required philosophy. While seeking to avoid the implication of dictating results to natural scientists, the Debronites situated philosophy above the natural sciences. It interpreted the findings of the natural sciences. Engels effectively supported the Debronites on this issue. He said that regardless of the naivete of the natural scientists, they were necessarily dominated by philosophical concepts. For Debrin, this justified the project of encompassing nature within a total dialectical philosophy. 
Theoretically, this approach stood within scientific Hegelianism, and politically it served the Debernites well for a while. In the first years of the Russian Revolution, the independence of the natural scientists was threatening. They were suspected of harboring bourgeois sympathies. For this reason, the defense of the autonomy, even priority of natural science by the mechanists was suspect. It shored up, not challenged, the fiefdom of the natural scientists. Official policy during the 1920s, especially during the years of, the, of Deborin's supremacy, 1928 to 1931, sought to undermine the ideological autonomy of natural scientists. Insofar as the Debernites elevated philosophy to a theoretical throne, they were convenient allies. Marxist philosophy interpreted and perhaps commanded the natural scientists. By 1929, the mechanists had been officially condemned and the Debernites awarded the philosophical loot, key research posts and journals. The official condemnation accused the mechanists of objectively obstructing the penetration of the natural sciences by the methodology of dialectical materialism. Yet the victory of the Debernites was brief. Their links to a Hegelian tradition ensured the their downfall. They valued Hegel too highly and balked at completely subordinating philosophy to the party commands. So ran the charges against them. In the heat of the conflict, one of the Debernites proclaimed, Yes, we are Hegelians. Everything great in modern history has been in, in one way or the other connected with Hegel's name. Stalin intervened and coined a term for Debernite thought, Menshevizing idealism. Mark Bor Borisovic Mitten, the newly anointed philosopher, handled the presentation. The critics of Lucas's Hegelian idealism were indicated in the same court. Mitten noted that Deborin's Institute spent three or four years studying only Hegel's logic. This produced a Hegelian Hegelianization of materialism of Marxism. Mitten announced the announced the liquidation of all autonomous philosophy. He applied with enthusiasm, enthusiasm the notion of partiness or partisanship, which subordinated philosophy to the practical imperatives of the party. The new phase of philosophy must emphasize the Leninist principle of the partiness of philosophy, the natural sciences, and the sciences generally. This would be the best antidote against the present strong and bold tendencies of revisionism in Marxist philosophy, its idealistic Hegelian perspective, beginning with Lucas and ending with the Deborin group. In the Soviet Union, Marxism corroded into a series of bald pronouncements and principles. In Europe, the defeats of the revolution reinforced the domination of orthodoxy and branded Western Marxism, making only occasional forays into political economy and tactics. Western Marxism retreated to aesthetics, philosophy, and psychoanalysis. Unorthodox Marxists were eased out and expelled from the communist parties. History in class consciousness and Marxism and philosophy presaged these developments, but were still drenched in the past. They breathed in, in, in an atmosphere of political choices and possibilities as the doors banged shut.